Okay, we're recording now, so welcome to the community call of the 16th of April, 2024. I'm going to be chairing, and uh, uh, that means that sometimes I'm going to have to skip back to the documents, so apologies for those watching on video afterwards uh, when you see our minutes and things like that. Um, but the first thing uh, we need to do is introductions, if you've not been here before. Um, Jim, you've been here before, or you haven't? Um uh, to our community call if not if you haven't uh, just say hi who you are and what you do um uh i don't think i've been on these community calls before i'm i'm jim kitchen i also work at anaconda um with some of these fine folks um yeah I, that's it <laughs> that's enough yeah that's, that's it. it i like my script it's good stuff so. yeah <laughs> yeah yeah Awesome. That's great. Uh, so let me just go back to uh, the notes and have a look. So the next items are uh, an announcements. So that's me. Uh, mm -hmm. Just to make sure that everybody knows that the latest version of PyScript was released yesterday. Um, go check out the release notes on GitHub. Uh, the best bit of this, and uh, kudos to Andrea for this, is that MicroPython now supports the terminal properly. Uh, big shout out to Damien as well for all the hard work that he's put into that. Um, and so uh, we, uh, ever onwards, uh, is uh, is how it goes. Um, so that's it for the announcements. Um, uh, on to the agenda items. So we have two Ooh. items. The first one is going to be Andrea on WebR. Uh, progress and gotchas, and then following that is going to be Fabio on MicroPython and the new PyWeb uh, UI. Um, so, without further ado, Andrea, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, that's okay. I'm going to share my screen, the entire screen. And you can see is test page. Hopefully, I zoomed in enough. Yep. To show <laughs> the mighty webinar. So, first of all, first thing to notice it's not as fast as MicroPython, but it's fast enough. So, whenever I refresh, it's it's pretty it's pretty quick to come up and enable my button that is just showing or actually printing in the standard output what's the R version we are running with. Um, this little demo <laughs> was already to me a huge <laughs> success <laughs> because um, let's uh, a bit of background. This morning, Nicholas told me, "How about WebR?" And I was like, "Yeah, I think I, I tried that before, and there were bits and bobs that were not working so nicely." And it was like, how about again? <laughs> and, uh, and and then I, so this is the page you're seeing. It's just script type web app. Um, and this, this is, is in, not... this is, Andrea, just to be clear for people who don't know, this is in PolyScript, which is the kernel of PyScript. Yeah. Yeah, it's written tiny probably on your screen up here, but this is the PolyScript project, which the only goal of PolyScript project is to enable WebAssembly targeting uh, runtimes. Um, it's the project behind PyScript. But it's really a bare project that provides nothing, so there's no... There's no module, there's no magic, there's no, nothing we provide in PyScript is in here because we use PyScript to augment PolyScript uh, runtimes to, to, to provide all the things that we want and that works today. Um, but because we need to enable our runtime before landing that on PyScript, um, in this case, it's just WebR. So this is the runtime we are enabling here. It still it has ability to webr click print version print version is a function defined here i don't know how much you are familiar with r i'm literally zero knowledge <laughs> about r but it's actually easy enough to to catch up and understand what 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 it's doing behind the scene 
And it's all about numbers and stuff and arrays and, and, and all these kind of things to work with, which probably for people interested in the field is awesome. But for me, it was even to arrange to define these, it was uh, quite an adventure today. Um, but it was a good one because I learned a bit of R and uh, at the same time... Um, Put it on your CV, to... quick. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, so to enable a web R, um, I have to create in my interpreter folder, uh, we have some private utilities that are shared or used among interpreters, but you can read interpreters in here. MicroPython, PyDite, Ruby, Wasm, Wazi, Asmon, which is Lua, and WebR. So the WebR is this file, and pretty much every interpreter has to provide. So if you if you see the interpreter file beside all the um, own utilities needed to run the interpreter, they all share the same structure. So so they have to provide um, a URL or a module way, uh, a URL through the module, so an ECMAScript module to, to actually run the interpreter, uh, an engine, which is the interpreter itself, a way to register JS module, which is um, available for almost every other interpreter, but not R right now. And don't, please don't focus on the <laughs> on all the comments I put. I will explain those. Um, a run, which is supposed to run synchronously, run a sync, a run event, which is when you click on something and something else uh, should be should, should react to it. So you click and you want to do stuff with the event. That's the event. That's actually the native JavaScript event. Um, a transform utility, which is used when from a worker you try to post results, and so transforms actually transform actually uh, is the way to convert uh, results from the worker and invoke something on the on the on the main thread, um, which is not necessarily used if you just run your stuff on main thread, and a write file, which is actually um, it use, let me check, Python, MicroPython, yeah, okay, or maybe Pilot, but it doesn't matter. So it's basically use the native mscript and fs, path, pathfs utilities when available, or uses just the fs when available, which is the case of R, um, we have a shim, so a sort of polyfill, which means we kind of uh, replaces the missing features from the from the module itself, from the WebAssembly module, to write stuff on the on the on the virtual file system. And WebR has one too, but there are a lot of little things that I found about WebR. Um, first of all, it works. So that, that's the great news. Uh, I, can, I can refresh and click this button as much as I want. So you can see the, the incremental thing because uh, my uh, is grouping signal message on console. But I can keep doing this forever. So it works without issues. And, um, and that's the cool thing. The, the not so cool thing, first of all, I don't know R too much, so um, it's hard for me to find hacks or workarounds in R because I don't know I don't know the internals and I don't know, especially in this case of the WebAssembly port, I don't know internals for it. But there are a few things that I tried to summarize in here. So blockers, and I put blockers in quotes because these are not necessarily blockers, but this is what I've um, experienced so far to provide a one-to-one -one MicroPython or PyoDide-like uh, API and everything else um, 
to PyUnite, and sorry, to PyScript later on, not in PolyScript. So PolyScript just enables the runtime. PyScript is the project that should enable all runtimes to, to run seamlessly. And so you can import stuff from PyScript module and all these kind of things. And um, extra magic should happen. Um, so web are blockers for PyScript project. Uh, so th this can run in PolyScript, but not really, because there are gotchas also around the worker thing, so which is a um, plot twist of the WebR uh, choice of um, uh, patterns. So first of all, calling JS or translating JS references is half possible. So string, boolean, null, uh, Arrays, type of arrays, all the things that have to deal with numbers um, are working out of the box. But as, as, as soon as you try to um, translate a literal JavaScript object, which is a mix of maybe string fields, maybe Boolean fields, maybe something else fields, maybe a function in the field. So JavaScript objects can have it all. Um, especially uh, instances like an event could, could be with the prevent default and stuff like that and also its own properties like the type and, and everything else. So this is not working. Um, the 0.3.2, we are at this version right now, demoing this right now, um, not, not really working. And there is a link uh, in my comment that shows that Actually, it's a, an official statement. JavaScript objects are a future thing to think about in R, in Web R, uh, as it is right now. This is kind of blocker for a lot of things that I will discuss um, shortly, um, because this is the list I want to show you. So everything is a sync for some reason. So they decided to never block the main thread out of the box. It doesn't matter if it's a Node.js or BAN or Dino or whatever, or the web. Um, they decide to bootstrap their own worker logic out of the box, which is an extra, and probably the reason it takes a bit more than MicroPython to bootstrap. So they orchestrate, they or, the, the, they orchestrate their, their own bootstrap and um, and this is problematic for for various reasons in in our projects. First of all, because they bypass our um, intention to either run synchronously or synchronously. They just decided that everything has to be asynchronously. But um, this is also an issue because they state in their in their official documentation that you need a shared array buffer, which is what we need when we want to run asynchronously. It's not clear to me why they decided to go full uh, shared array buffer out of the box, because the interpreter is there and it can produce synchronously things, and we can do the shared array buffer dance ourselves when we decide to run the interpreter and the worker. So these is actually a major issue we have for other reasons down f further down. So the file system is limited. Oh, the file system is limited, uh, meaning there are, it's not the, the whole thing, it's just a few methods exposed and all of those methods are async too. And for a virtual file system that's supposed to be in memory, I don't, I don't see that uh, interesting for us, and uh, actually, it doesn't also, it doesn't work because our logic around the file system is that it's the M script that provided file system, which is synchronous by M script and documentation and definition. So this is a half issue because we can still expose write file, read file, and all this kind of stuff, but it's going to be asynchronous, so everyone has to wait for it. There is a shelter um, handler for input-output. That's standard input, uh, sorry, standard output and standard error. 
um, which is a bit ugly because that's also asynchronous and I need to orchestrate behind the scene me dropping references for the um, garbage collector, internal gar garbage collector, which, it, which is kind of working. So quick, quick one. So I'm here, I, I'm using a shelter capture R and I need to redirect the output this type can be either SDDIO or uh, sorry SDD out or SDDR, and uh, and I need to do redirect the output. But the thing is that this output, this loop, happens only after awaiting are executing this code. Um, what's the issue there is that this is not incremental, so the R is not producing standard IO while it's processing. So if I have something okay at line two and something really bad or an error at line 20, um, I only get the line 20 thing. Um, that was kind of weird because we're, we're, with both MicroPython and PyoDite or, or Ruby even, um, while the code is getting interpreted, we have errors print out if there's something going on, it's it's all while executing. It's not just at the end of it. So this is something I need to investigate a little bit more because they have also a shared global shelter for um, any generic I.O. Also, what I've noticed, which is not in this list, is that there are the, the module I'm using, they are bootstrapping only one environment. And so if I define in a different scripts, different things, they are all communicated to each other. So if I define, so if, if in here, um, I do this, like uh, test equal one, and here I do uh, print test. So despite the fact that in any other interpreter, this should throw an error unless the env, in, this is polyscript again, uh, unless the env is the same. Um, somehow, if I have multiple scripts, um, it doesn't matter. So the, the bootstrap behind the scene with their module is still leaking this test to the new bootstrap. Mm. Um, this was also unexpected. Um, what else? Uh, oh yeah, I already mentioned, I, I should try to explore the hooking into the global shared uh, shelter um, because probably I can, oh gosh, every time I, I do that, um, every time, um, so the, the global shelter should allow me to set up the uh, standard output and standard error and um, i haven't tried that yet probably that's a better thing that i'm doing right now and events so if you check again and i close it if you check again this i'm doing print version the print version should receive an event the event story on the main at least in both pyodite and micropython uh we can we can actually we can actually prevent default. We can actually access all the events things in R. We can't do any of that. So that's the reason I even need to do event type. And type is actually the only thing I'm passing along when it comes to event. So run event has a lot of gotchas and I need to do to translate somehow to um, data frame my event, but that translates for type and other things, but it doesn't translate well with um, um, with methods like prevent default or anything else. Most importantly, the fact this is a sync, it means any attempt, even on the main, to stop propagation, it will fail miserably. It doesn't matter if this is uh, a data frame or not, this will fail miserably and that's that's ugly on the DOM. Um, but not necessarily a blocker. Again, the blockers is like, what do we want from WebR? 
Is this good enough? Is it not? So this is a discussion we might we might have further down the road. Um, our JS module cannot land on ARM. So if you check uh, the register JS module, um, I just warn, and if you check my demo, you see experimental interpreter module polyscript JS module is not supported, but this one will be a stretch goal already. The module polyscript is not supported, meaning that we cannot provide neither polyscript nor PyScript. So this is another issue we, we're going to have because, because of the first point. We cannot translate JS into R easily. So JS can be an object literal, like a module, which can have uh, strings, numbers, and methods, especially a module which is going to have methods. And this is not working at all right now. So this is another blocker if we need ever to have PolyScript or Py, PyScript or any other module that we can inject out of the JS world. Transforming values, this is another issue. So um, the 2JS, which is common also in MicroPython and PyLite, is asynchronous. And it's not just asynchronous, it returns a, a, an object that contains few fields um, among these fields, there is a values that probably will return what we expect. But because the 2JS dance is also synchronous, um, this requires not just changes, actually. is I'm not saying this is bad, that something needs to be transformed asynchronously, but this is the thing that um, <laughs> doesn't excite me. Yeah. So mm. the, the, we, we need to fully change Coincident, which is the project behind that, the project that allows workers and not workers, actually mostly workers when it comes to web workers, it allows workers to synchronously deal with the uh, with the uh, with the main thing or with the interpreter or whatever it is um, or main callbacks. This is an issue, a big issue, because if the worker needs to await, all our sync story in the worker fails. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to rush any conclusion around this, but the worker story for us is like we can. We can do whatever we want on the main thread synchronously, like it is synchronously and naturally for, for every programming language to just query or or check document.body.text content. I don't know. Any of these will suddenly not work anymore if I make that asynchronously because we need to await the transform if we ask for... Uh, uh, parsing from the main, I'm just naming a, a basic function for no reason whatsoever. It's a dumb example, but if we ask for part, part, uh, parsing and it's going to be a string with a one zero and we want to return 10, that always works synchronously in the worker and we don't want probably this to change. And so this is a, a bit of an issue because the code you write in a worker cannot be synchronous anymore if we use WebR, simply because WebR is asynchronous by default. So everything we do is going to be asynchronous. They require, in their documentation, share the right buffer. Oh, gosh, I keep clicking that. Share the right buffer, um, meaning that if we have use cases where the headers from the server are not really handled, Minicoy is not a possibility, and and all these kind of things, um, WebR just doesn't work. And this is clearly stated in their docs. That's their first point. It's like we need. Um, okay, zoom in these headers to at least enable COP and COIL because they are using 
shared array buffer. And so it's the same issue we have with workers, except we don't necessarily require workers if you just run um, you, you, we don't necessarily need to enable shared array buffer if you run MicroPython on the main thread or even PyLite. You need shared array buffer when you want to run your code in, the, in a seamless way in the worker. So, um, so, so Andres, that's the yeah, yeah. yeah. So the uh, awesome. I mean, uh, th this was a kind of a. Huh. How much effort would it take to get R working with PolyScript? Because, you know, it's interesting to see what other scripting languages um, are doing at the moment and the potential that, you know, potential use cases of them. But it, it sounds to me as a kind of a thumbnail summary. Uh, um, Fabio, I see your hand up, so I'm going to be very, very quick. Um, also, I also noticed that whilst you were presenting, Fabio was blowing his nose, so you brought him to tears. Is uh, it was so moving this uh, this demo as well. Uh, anyway, uh, aside from that, it sounds to me that the R, uh, the Web R folks have made that decision to put things on a web worker, so it's asynchronous. But uh, that means clearly because we have our own story around web workers, there it's going to be very complicated to to resolve that unless we just allow folks to keep doing what web r is expected them to do and we stand away i guess uh but that but as far as i can tell i can asynchronously just get a whole bunch of r code to evaluate something and return a result from that worker when needed that's that's currently all i'm able to do really i yeah, don't want to do any dom manipulation i don't want to do anything I don't want any JavaScript libraries. I don't want anything like that. I just want to say, here's a bit of R code. Do your kind of numbery thing that R is famous for, um, and you know, back comes the result. That that's what we've got at the moment. Um, so, so to, to to summarize how it is right now, if you run web R as it is right now in a worker, you actually don't need to. Because whenever you bootstrap WebR on the main thread, they're gonna run on the worker regardless. Yeah. It's like it's like they're gonna use a worker regardless. <laughs> so you can yeah. use WebR on the main or on the worker. In the worker, you're just gonna have a extra delay overhead of proxying things around. On the main thread, they're gonna use a worker anyway. So the worker Actually, it's not working now also. <laughs> That's also something to talk about. I tried to use just the worker attribute. It's not working. And so the worker is not possible right now with work bar because they are bootstrapping their own worker by themselves. Yeah. So we can have R interacting with the main without blocking, which is cool. And if it's a main asking R only thing, there are... Um, few things to consider like whenever you have a result you need to convert into two array two type of array two number two boolean two but that's part of their own thing yeah. right so we can we can enable that you don't need a worker anymore but the caveats are around the fact that you still need your server to use to, to to allow shared array buffer. Yeah. Because otherwise they don't work. Yeah. So even if yeah. you don't use the worker attribute, which we documented, like when what once you do worker, it's not blocking. But if you don't want a worker blocking, you need to use share yeah, yeah. um we, we need shared array buffer. And if you don't want to the worker to block ever the main and you just need to call worker functionalities, you use um, the 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 JS the the sorry the config the pi pi config tomo with a um, sync main only true mm. and the sync main only true works in our case because we 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 can tell our code okay there is this config flag please don't try to even use the shared array buffer because nobody needs it but in the web R case. You can't but, tell call it true. Yeah, 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 yeah. So from Google, they've made a even, the, yeah, they've they they've decided for us already. Yeah, yeah. they decided that either they work out of these headers, yeah, 
because they they use shared dive buffer because they bootstrap web uh, web bar out of workers out of the box which i can kind of relate to their decision but at the same time to me is a weird decision because the deciding if you should block or not it shouldn't be a web assembly thing it should be a consumer thing yeah so i want uh, my I'm... thing to block because i want to write my own my entire thing in yeah. on the main and that's bad or whatever but that's what javascript does anyway if you if you have a huge library on the main that blocks stuff so it shouldn't mm -hmm. be to me a concern from them but at the same time we don't have we don't get to tell them don't use a shared dark buffer thing and don't yeah. and don't give us results uh like that now i, I uh, ha hang on Andrea. I, i'm just conscious i'm just conscious of the time as well uh because uh, i i know fabio has a question and then fabio ha has his, his go, thing go Fa fabio quick question and then if anybody else has a very quick comment and then I, i'm anxious to get on to fabio's part of the the meeting as well yeah mine wasn't be going to be a question anyway uh it was how keeping us uh you know uh i'm time tracked um also because a lot of these things are not tactical discussions they're yes. they're really strategic because they will require a lot of time right so first thing andrea actually the crowd got andrea again and uh, you know out of oh we had this idea this morning and now boom uh it's working so as usual uh really really great job um impressive <laughs> Uh, yeah, Andrea is the new Rick Rolled uh, of the 2020s. Anyway, uh, so that's great. The second thing, I, I would think the best option here is to wrap this work up and with the, the best bow that we have and taking into account all those considerations and everything else, put it out as a very experimental thing and see what the community wants, what's what's value we have from this, blah blah, blah and let all of that drive our roadmap. Uh, I wouldn't. I would try to not spend much time on this right, right out of the blue because we also have other things. But this is a major thing that unlocks a whole new thing, and we just need to use our test and see where the community wants to go before we start working on things. Um, that's my two cents. Yeah, the good thing is that about the course and headers, we can just point out their documentation, but uh, we, we, we need to explain what's different. And what's different, and I never thought about it, is that the worker story can work right now because the worker is always enabled, no matter what. And actually, if we add the worker attribute, it's going to be a mess because we're working the worker and the worker is not working. <laughs> and, uh, and so it's, uh, it's, it, it's, it's, uh, it's turning into a tongue twister. You know, she sells yeah, seashells yeah, on the seashore. Yeah. The worker works the worker, working workers, working workery or something like that. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. So webbar is, webbar is working fine. Yeah. So webbar is fine. But yeah. the, the, the technical details behind the scenes. Yeah. Um, it's the devil's always in the details, isn't it? Yeah, that's that's exactly, that's, that's exactly. the problem. Now I just want to. I'm sorry for being bossy. I must apologise for that. But uh, I I want to make sure that Fabio has a, has a good good long amount of time to be able to sort of explain explain his thing as well. So Fabio, matey, as always, it's wonderful to hear you speak. So come on, what have you Not got, matey? As you know, in my nature, I'm very dry and short, so no worries. We will not, we don't need too much time. <laughs> um, now, trying to get to the core of the topic really quick. Um, so I've had this PR open for forever around the PyWeb UI, and it basically adds supports for element creation, manipulation, and things like this. Part of it was my insane schedule and I've been working on this on spare time whenever I have. But the other side of it is that I've been having issues with MicroPython working uh, with this part. And I thanks Andrea for checking that out as well. Uh, I, there's part of it that is MicroPython just not being able to run things beyond a certain size. Um, directly with the run right i think some other parts do have 
There may be a, a API incompatibility between the two, uh, full Python and and MicroPython. And I, mostly because I saw some errors around like the inspect module having different signatures uh, compared to the full Python. So that that's the thing. Um, all things that we can fix. And I and the other side of it is that I, I and I knew that already. I was being very generous on managing the link between JavaScript and Python. So basically not caring too much about things and being memory because uh, trusting that the proxies in the Pyodide side will clean stuff, uh, that's probably not the case for MicroPython. So there, there, there's work we can do there to basically just load things in memory, the, the JavaScript object in memory, do whatever we need and then clean that up and do that every time. So basically transform that into a property rather than the thing that we have attached to the class. But with all that said, uh, there is, this work has been dragging and supporting MicroPython is probably not a thing that is days away. It's probably weeks depending on how Damien also um, has time to fix stuff and, and whatnot. So he ha I just wanted to bring just, that, that just here. Just add some context. At this moment in time, Damien became a new dad a fortnight ago. So yes, hey, hey, yes. happy new dad times for Damien. So we need to be respectful of Damien's time. But at the same time, next week, I have a catch up call with Damien because we have a regular kind of virtual coffee together, if you see what I mean. So I can bring this yeah. stuff to him after he shared all his baby pictures with me. Um, yeah, so, and I don't, and I don't want him to feel pressure in this very exactly, moment of his life, exactly. right? Like I respectful, yeah, yeah. Yes. So what but, I'm but, thinking but is, Fabio, let's face it, we've both been dads, and sometimes you need a break from nappies and milk. Oh and no, yeah, yeah. Like totally. So you know, I'm happy to provide that for him if he wants that too. But uh, yeah, yes, we need to yeah. be very respectful of of Damien's time is the important thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So as you said i think we need to be ready to just say hey this is waiting for you but yeah. no 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 rush you know buddy we 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 can yeah. we can wait that's fine so uh, what i'd like to propose is that i do a quick cleanup and raise an error whenever you are in micropython saying this is not a supported feature yet pretty much like we did with the terminal yeah. we get it out there uh and let users try it out it actually is also a good opportunity to do the the work that we wanted to do on splitting the module and only a lo loading the shoot the, the other things the markdown and other things at if you're using them uh, and you put in the in the config so I think there's a lot of value that can put out there even not not supporting MicroPython so that's what I would suggest we do uh, uh, thoughts ideas suggestions questions. Um, we, uh, Damien has already, um, sorry, Martin, I saw you put your hand up halfway through me starting speaking, but uh, yeah, exactly. I'll, I'll just say something and then you can go. Cause I, anyway, shut up, Nicholas. Uh, Damien's already been interacting with us on GitHub, uh, yesterday. Andrea created a, a very quick way of being able to recreate yeah. the problem. Damien's gone. Ah, yes, it's because of this. Um, and mm -hmm. the conversation's ongoing. So let's see what, what happens with that. Um, but uh, yeah, Martin, sorry, my apologies. You're on mute, mate. I am mute. Um, yeah, so the thing about the PyWeb um, API, the thing we were talking about with between Invent and Toga and, um, and then potentially LTK and PyWeb.UI is making sure that somehow, some way, maybe it's done externally, maybe PyWeb, maybe the APIs don't have to do it, but the idea of being able to bind properties to data sources. Like, um, and it, so that the way that we have it in Invent, right, you can say this property comes from a data store. And now we've got that actually implemented as inherently as part of our property descriptor API. But then um, Malcolm did some work making that kind of binding work ex like externally from the descriptor side of things. So, but my real point of bringing this up was one of the important parts of the next layers up of PyScript is to be able to have reactive UIs that basically, you know, that you can, you can change things in a data store and it will automatically update. That's like the layers as you get towards kind of Pythonic kind of view or React apps. 
and um and it'd be kind of nice to make sure we coordinate that work between toga invent and PyWeb and ltk to make sure we all support that because it's almost like that's as important as the widget api to make sure these things interact it's the it's at the property level how we do that binding i think is going to be quite important mm -hmm. so it's just like yeah just a thing we should keep an eye on really yeah yeah agreed um uh Actually, that should probably be an announcement is that LTK, uh, Chris Laffer's LTK project yeah. has become a part of the uh, PyScript projects as well. If you're not familiar with LTK, it's, well, the clue's in the name. Uh, it's like TK Inter ish in terms of its Python API, uh, but it's actually a wrapper around jQuery and it's kind of like a one-to-one -one mapping with, with the HTML elements underneath and things like that. So, uh, um, yeah, uh, Andrea. So a quick one from me for Fabio. I agree with what you say. If we don't want to provide the, the PyWeb entirely for MicroPython, whatever it doesn't work, it's, it's okay. Right now, nothing can work because PyDi just <laughs> breaks. So we still need to figure out how to fix that. And the issue, like Nicolas said, is on them in attention, but we, we cannot land something that breaks out of the box, MicroPython. And uh, that's a bummer. It's not on you, it's not your fault. Uh, it's something that Damian knows how to fix, something that I investigated. But beside that, we, we still need to have a MicroPython update uh, to, to land it, because otherwise we can't have even the PyScript module. We can't have anything because it breaks the code out of the box. So this is just oh, an end. What, what I'm is saying is that oh, change the PR so that on the, when you are on MicroPython, you don't even load that part. So, so it wouldn't okay. break. In, it, will, it, will, it would pretty much like the terminal that was not supported with MicroPython earlier. We, you, we would just be like, hey, this is not supported. Yeah, but we, we okay, that, that's possible. But right now we create the standard lib as an artifact. Mm -hmm. um, so we need two standard lib artifacts, yeah. one with it in and one with it out, is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. so the standard lib is a, a file that gets evaluated, and we need to find out a way to not evaluate something when it's... Yeah, or, maybe, or maybe add an evaluation at the end of the the core standard library and then you add the pyodide stuff on I, I don't know there are lots of ways to skin that cat though aren't there yeah we, we were looking we we're gonna look into uh optionally loading things anyway yeah, because exactly. of you know yeah we, we uh, need to get that story right yeah yeah just for the sake of time i would say i wouldn't dig into this right now but i i would post on this topic and maybe tomorrow we, we can have a quick meeting just to talk about about that if yeah. that works i think that, works. The my intuition is well, basically what you just said, Fabio, which is having um, a conditional way of loading things as you need them, because not everybody wants PyWeb, not everybody wants LTK, but some people do want LTK, and they really, you know, uh, so let's make that easy for them. Um, but these aren't PyPI uh, modules or something; these are kind of like flags that we need to be able to set in the uh, in the in the settings. Um, so we need to figure out. How does that feel to the end user and, you know, have some proposals, discuss it on GitHub. Let's make that happen. I think is the, is the thing to do there, which is, which is a cool thing. Any more questions for Fabio? Very pensive looking right. lot you are. Uh, <laughs> so I'll take advantage of this, the, the, the time to say one, thank you for reminding me that LTK is in, uh, totally forgot. Uh, and uh, was fairly easy and like great on Chris' part to want to merge the project. That's really great for the community. Um, the other thing that came to mind, Andre, I think, yes, I think I saw the discussion around minifying and, and things like this. Um, I think Chris did some work to around that, not minifying, but uglyfying. So that your Python code is not just transparent. Um, yeah. So I, I would say. Yeah. 
Function yeah. names became single character UTF characters, for instance. So yeah, it was yeah. unifying as a side effect of the uglification, is the is what I remember. Exactly. So it, there may be some work if he wants to to share or whatever. Like we can actually at least talk with him and talk about approaches and stuff, um, and not start from scratch. Yeah. That's cool. The topic. Cool. Um. Uh, okay, so if there's nothing else, um, I'm going to stop the video, and thank you very much for everybody's contributions. Uh, I've just been trying to look at my clock, which is kind of over there, to see what we're doing. Uh, okay, uh, let me stop the